term that was brought to me years ago. Anybody ever heard a term like breaking something off or breaking chains or breaking bondages or break off an oppressor? Ever heard those terms before? And years ago, and it kept repeating as a question in my head, God would say, so what does it mean to break a chain? And I would love Wednesday because we have dialogue, but I can't do it today. And I would, and I would say, well, God, you know, you know, when you break someone free of an addiction. And he said, yeah, but how? And I would say, okay, I have ideas. And then later on, months later, God would say, what do you mean I break this situation, or I break this oppression, or I break a curse? And I would say, God, why do you, why do you keep asking me? I, I used to see ministers, they would, somebody would come forward, he would just say, break. And the guy would, something would happen to him. And then another guy, just, he, his whole word was break. And I was like, why do people minister this way? And God kept reminding me that question. This went on for years. And finally, God stuck a verse on my head. And it all made sense. And I want to share that with you this morning. But it's a little bit advanced. Y'all can do it with me. So the sermon title this morning is called The Breaker. And I want you guys to become breakers. Again, a breaker. Like somebody breaks, so a breaker. It's actually very powerful. And I'm excited if you can't already tell. So here's what I'm going to do. King James uses the word breaker, but it's a little complicated. So let's look at a verse, if you don't mind. Micah 2.13, I want you to take notes. Micah 2.13, we're going to look at the New American Standard, and then we'll go back to my comfortable uh, New King James. So KJV, New American Standard, and several other translations use the word of breaker. Look at this carefully. Micah 2.13. The breaker goes up before them. They break out. They pass through the gate and go out by it. So the king goes on before them and the Lord at their head. We've been studying the Jordan, and we've been talking about making your Jordan last Wednesday as well. Remember, Wednesday we talked about what it means to establish your Jordan. For each of us, we have a finish line. Each of us are dealing with something we're trying to break through. But there's also a kind of person who I would say has a breakthrough anointing. That sounds charismatic, but let's deal with it. A breakthrough anointing is somebody who the Bible calls as a breaker. He's somebody who can tear down a wall like Jericho. And then the people of God can take possession. It's not just that God is at work like you see here. It says specifically, so the king goes on and the Lord at their head. So the breaker is a person. How many of you understand that? The breaker is not God. If you look very carefully, it says the breaker is a person who went up first like a forerunner. And then the king goes and the Lord at their head. Because if it said the king would have broken out, right? Or it said God would have been the breaker. It would be capital B. How many of you understand that? If that's hard, just bear with me. I'm going to go through some examples. It's going to go to Wednesday, as a matter of fact. So it's important to understand that you can become a breaker. Now, if you want to understand what that means, let's look at the New King James now. So let's go to Micah 2, verse 12 and 13. We've got to understand the context, because at the end of this, you're going to minister what it means to break. So here you go. So God says, I will surely assemble all of you. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put together put to them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise. So God's saying, I have a huge gathering of people. And then he says, verse 13, which says specifically, the one who breaks open. So out of a mass gathering, here comes a person, amazing, and they will stand forth and they will break down the wall and then the king and God will go in. How many understand that just yet? How many understand that? Is that okay? So there are people who carry a power, an anointing, or a position with God, appointed to a position, that when you have a group of people with a mass expectation, imagine standing in the Red Sea. Here is 600,000, a million people standing in the Red Sea. And one guy's going to stand and say, I'm going to tear that down. How many understand that? Is that okay? It's important to realize that God uses breakers today. These are people who carry a breakthrough anointing. And when there's a wall... They will not stand and say, well, it's your turn. Okay, it's your turn. Okay, let's pray. Let's think about it. Okay, well, I'm waiting for God. Man, I stand still and know the will of God. Okay, be still and know that Lord. There's a guy that says, you keep talking, I'm going to start walking. And things change. How many understand that? That's what I want to show you today. Micah 2, verse 12 and 13. And again, just to kind of share a background story. When I saw the scripture, I had quite a series of events happened to me in the spirit. And I said, oh, this is not for me, this is for everybody. You know me. And so we got some discussion to do. And first of all, I want you to believe this. That's how we get started. I've said this for years, but I'm say it again because it's complicated. Whenever God brings a doctrine to NCG, you should say what? 
Because I'm part of this, I have to become part of it. The body receives what the body receives. Is that fair? If the head gives something to the body, 1 Corinthians 12, yeah, 12 so, that means the body should operate in it. Is that fair? So that means if God speaks something to this church, we being the body must operate as a breaker. You don't come in and go, well, okay, well, that was interesting. You say, you know what, I'm going to do this. By the end of today, I'm going to do this. Good. So here's a question. How? How does somebody become a breaker? What does it even mean to become the breaker, the one who breaks something? What does that, I mean, okay, good. Do I just lay hands on everybody and just throw oil at you? Do we make it work like that? We have to talk about this. So in the days of Israel and Judah, back in the Old Testament, you had kingdoms. Is that fair? You had kingdoms and dominions. You had what? Egypt, right? Assyria. You had Philistines. Remember the Phil Philistia? You had... All nations, Syria, all kinds of nations, Moab, Ammonites, and they would war against Egypt. I'm sorry, against Israel. And during those times, at bench sometimes when Israel was in sin, they would take command over them. Is it okay with that? So there were times when Israel would fall into bondage by their oppressors. Was Egypt an oppressor of Israel? Was Egypt an oppressor of Israel, right? For 400 something years. 450 or 400, they kind of choose both numbers. The Philistines took dominion over Israel. Is that okay? Remember, that even in for Gideon, the Midianites took possession. When they took possession over God's people and took dominion, they became oppressors. If you're taking notes, what is an oppressor? It's when somebody takes authority over you. When somebody takes dominion other than God, you are now under oppression. Now that sounds harsh, but I want you to think. Today are there kingdoms and dominions. Yes. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 there are principalities, powers, powers of the air, demons, strongholds. And people say, I don't see them. Yeah, you don't see them, but you see the effects of them. Most people don't see cancer. They just find out they have cancer. Most people don't know they have a heart attack. They have a heart attack. Most people don't know they have a divorce. They get into a divorce. Let me understand this. There are dominions operating this world. We call them as a result of what happened. Are you following? Did you know that cancer can walk a room and touch somebody and you have cancer? I don't know if you understood that. Cancer is a dominion that manifests itself in your body. It's a spirit that operates. It's a dominion. You are now under the oppression of cancer. And the world does what it can. God bless them for trying. Is it okay with this? You can also be the, under the oppression of addiction. Addiction is a spirit. It takes dominion. It forces you to do what it wants you to do. That guy says he's addicted to alcohol. I said it's not the alcohol. It's the addiction. There's alcohol. All of us can go buy alcohol right now. Well, most of us. God bless you. Little. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? We drive right by alcohol. We don't care. It's the addiction, the dominion, the oppression that forces you. Now you say, Michael, why are you so hyper about this? When I talk about somebody who's going to become a breaker, I'm not concerned about what you're dealing with. I'm concerned about what? The oppressor. Do you see the difference? I'm not throwing alcohol bottles going, never smoke again, don't throw all the cigarettes in the trash. I'm saying, who is the oppressor forcing his hand like a handcuff, like a chain to that cigarette box, making him broke? Forge his hand to that lottery ticket, saying, i got to buy lottery tickets every week or I'm not going to make it. I've seen people, addicted, poor people, suffering under tax oppression because of the lottery. What I'm saying is this. Is it really the lottery? Is it really alcohol? Is it really pornography? Or is there an oppression that is a spirit that yokes you? How many understand this so far? So when I talk about dominions in Scripture, and we look at them, you're going to hear names like Midian, Egypt, Assyria, Ammon, Moab. Today we have the same spirits operating as names. Cancer, genetic disease, just calling somebody, well, you're low IQ, you're never going to go anywhere. We just use words, it's still a spirit. And so for us to understand what it comes to be a breaker, we have to know who we're talking to. Not the manifestation, not the physical event, but the one forcing them to become that way. Is that okay? Good. I'll buy into that home. Now, why does that matter? When a spirit or a nation took over God's people, 
they put a yoke on them. Do y'all know what a yoke is? You know we have handcuffs? Think of a handcuff for oxen. Remember you have oxen plowing? They would put two oxen or two bulls together and they put like a ring around their neck with a long stick. So they have a long stick and two U's underneath, like two circles, and they put the neck in and they would, you know, they have the oxen, and they would walk like this, kind of like my wife. <laughs> ah, just kidding. And the joke is simply this. They would force you, the, the yoke was for animals, but this, the Bible or scripture used the term, they put a heavy yoke. Or the yoke of Egypt was oppressing God's people. The yoke of the Ammonites was oppressing God's people. The yoke of the Midianites was robbing them of all their crops. And they had to hide to do any kind of work. You have all these stories. It was a yoke. So today, when there's an oppressor, you as a breaker, what is your target? The yoke. I don't know if you're going to destroy cancer. If you're good, awesome. If you can rid this world of cancer today, stand up. But what you can do is break off a yoke. Are you following this? What we are going to do today is now that we've identified the breaker and we've identified the oppressor, I need to identify the yoke. The yoke is the, the device. It's not physical. It's in the spirit. It's what has chained this man, this believer, into forcing the will of the master. Right? They would put shackles and they would just drag you along by your neck or by even your nose. I hope you understand that. It's an ugly concept. But if you don't think that's happening today, friends, I don't know where you live. I don't know where you're going. You must just be inside all day. There are many, many people who are stuck under the oppression of a dominion. They are under the yoke of bondage. And what am I expecting of this church? You're going to break it. That's what you're called to do. That's what you are called to do. You are God's freedom. Your freedom army. You are people who are sent to break yokes. And don't tell me anybody here can't stand up and tell me you've never seen addiction before. Don't tell me no one has. But the world treats the addiction by saying, oh, but you know, alcohol, let's talk about the alcohol. No, I'm telling you, there's an addiction, an oppressive spirit that forces them. Oh, that was a lot. We got ways to go. We got this. Here's a verse you probably hear too often. Let's look at it. Let's deal with it. Isaiah 10, 27. This is the verse that people use, and we have to talk about this on Wednesday. But I'm just going to show it to you. It shall come to pass into that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder. It means when they had a yoke, they had a lot of weight. They just forced them to work all day. It sucks. And his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. So here's a charismatic response. The anointing will break the yoke, right? Everybody says the anointing. You come to an anointed minister, he'll break the yoke. Okay, good. Now I want to ask you a question. I'm Moses. He's Pharaoh. I'm going to take some cool water cologne and splash him. <laughs> Let my people go. Does he care? He said, man, thanks, man. I'm going to win the field all day. Well, that's good, man. Appreciate the oil. I mean, oil smells good. You bought those oil. Like, oh, wow, a tree of life. The scent of excellence. <laughs> I don't know if that's the answer. I'm not saying it's wrong. We'll talk about it Wednesday. But I don't think this is the big picture. I don't know if everybody here says, okay, Isaiah 10, 27. I'm going to go minister. I'm going to buy some oil. I'm going to go to my friend's house who's dealing with some deliverance issues. And hmm, let's see what happens. I think there's an understanding that Scripture gives us so that we can become breakers. All right, we'll talk about that verse later. First of all, we have to understand that God is the breaker. So just write down 2 Samuel 5. 2 Samuel 5, verse 20. And then 1 Chronicles 14. Verse 11, same scripture twice, 2 Samuel 5, verse 20, and 1 Chronicles 14, verse 11. Now the story is this. Let's read verse 20 of 2 Samuel 5. So David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there, and he said, The Lord has what? Broken through my enemies. Like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perizim. Now, the word Baal Perizim, that might not mean anything to you. Baal means Lord. It's a Hebrew word for Lord. Perez means breakthrough. Perizim just means plural. So, the Lord of breakthroughs. So, he basically said, the Lord of breakthroughs. The first understanding to become a breaker is to recognize you serve the God, the one and only God of breakthroughs by design. 
And you have to remember, as a child of God, you take on his nature. Anybody remember 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4? I wish I could quiz you now. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4 says that we are partakers of his divine nature through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As I said, moving forward, memorize it. So as I begin to understand how God broke through the enemies, I should break through enemies. Anybody understand? As I become more familiar how God decimated nations and oppressors, I can become like a breaker. And he said, Michael, you're making that up. Again, Scripture says that God has many breakers, and we have a lot to look at. There are many breakers throughout Scripture, but we want to understand how do we become breakers. Good. First thing we want to start with is simply this. What is God's mindset towards oppression? Now, everybody can have an opinion. Everybody here can say, okay, I just believe that God uses uh, oppression when he wants to. I just believe that God allows oppression to teach you. Okay, enjoy. Please don't pray for my church. Second people says, I know God wants to break oppression. And I would ask you, well, how? Okay, God break that. Okay, that's a good prayer. I appreciate that. But let's get scriptural evidence of what God says about breaking. Look at Psalm 72, verse 4. And believe me, there's like 20 of these. Psalm 72, we'll just pick one. Psalm 72, verse 4 says this. He will bring what? Justice. I want you to kind of frame that up. As I said, a breaker is somebody who brings justice, freedom, liberty. When the Spirit of the Lord is there, is liberty. That's a different verse. See, I'm telling you, when you're saying this, you understand why the Bible says when the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Why Luke 4 says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It's a different context. I will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy. And he will do what? He will break in pieces the oppressor. God's opinion is what? To smash it. I hate to tell you that. You were smashed glass? I do by accident. But it's okay. You were drawn. I mean, he just broke pieces. Like when you talk about shattering something in pieces, it's kind of a violent picture. Just drop a cup and look at it. Don't do it. Do it outside with, you know, plastic. <laughs> when you drop something, you see what he means is what is left of it. What value does something that's been shattered have? Like if you crack something, you can fix it. If you just, you know, nick it or paint over it, you, know, you can fix that. But you don't really fix what's shattered. As a matter of fact, in Job, look at that Wednesday. It says when God breaks something, it cannot be rebuilt. Again, in Job, it says when God breaks something, it cannot be rebuilt. You have to have that mindset as a breaker. That when I do this, it can't come back. You have to be bold and in faith, saying, God said, when I free you from this, you won't go back. Or at least it won't come back to you. Somebody chooses to go back. That's another story. All right, so let's look at this scripture again. We've been talking about God. So let's go back to Egypt. Egypt was one of the big oppressors. Look at Exodus 6, verse 6. Exodus 6, 6 says this. Therefore, say the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. So everybody knows the story of Egypt. It's easy, I assume. Easy for everybody here. Question. Did the people of Egypt even meet God in Egypt? Did the Israelites in Egypt meet God there? Does God show up? Okay, show me where. God goes and meets people in Egypt. Where does God show up to in this story anyways? He shows up where? Mount Horeb. That's not really the Egyptian land. He goes to Mount, Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai. Okay, so that's down the road. Matter of fact, Moses says it's about a journey. It's a considerable journey away. So he meets Moses. Doesn't really meet Aaron either. He says, hey, Aaron's on his way. Go, go hug him out. You know, close that wound. <laughs> Come back to friends. BFF or whatever. You guys understand? Was that hard? God doesn't show up. He goes and gets a breaker. Let's look at it again. God says, I'm going to bring you out by using a breaker to tear down the burdens and their bondage. God doesn't really show up in physical person. He sends a breaker named Moses. Does that make more sense, the second pass? Because I don't, I don't want to keep going. That was hard. It really doesn't have any value. We've got to make sure you're clear. 
So when we talk about God's heart, when we look at Psalm 72, 6, just a minute ago, and it said that God will break, sorry, Psalm 72, verse 4, that God will break in pieces the oppressor. How's he going to do it? Somebody just raise your hand and say, here I am, Lord. That's all he's saying. Is that hard? If God says, I'm going to break oppression, then you have to believe, I'm, he's looking at me. Because when you look at Exodus, I can show you the rest of the chapters that talk about this. He uses a man or a woman or somebody. You rarely see God appear and go, here I am as a spirit, father. Okay, stop it. He does it. He uses people. The reason it's so important to understand is, when someone says, can God raise me up as a breaker? You recognize the mandate's been given. What's the mandate? I must terrorize oppression. But God needs a person to do it. So who is he looking at? His army of freemen. The people who are slaves to Christ, but free from this world, and will use them to free people. Oh, okay, that's making sense. I hope somebody on video said, I got it. Good. Praise God for that. All right. So, again, we'll do a bit more detail on Wednesday, but I want to keep going for time's sake so we can keep rolling through this. The context, again, is simply this is a recap. God has been raising up breakers throughout the history of Scripture. It's a physical person that executes the heart and will of God. It's a person who, even though he has a nation with an expectation, when Israel was under the bondage of Egypt, do you think they had an expectation for freedom? Sure they did. I bet they were waiting. God, we've been praying for years. Where are you at? When they came to the Red Sea, do you think it was an expectation? Well, where, where, where are we now? I mean, there's a grave. There's watery. Thanks, Moses. When they came to Jericho, what do we do now? And when they come in, they're fronted by millions of people that came to destroy the God's people. What do we do now? Somebody would stand up and say, I believe for something greater. That was a man. That was a change agent. That was a catalyst. That was something that God said. The Spirit of God came upon him. And he made a change. It's not that different today. We are expecting you to wear a suit and have a degree in theology and go to three schools and go to four nations and raise five people from the dead. Okay, now you're in. I don't think so. I think God uses ordinary people as breakers because you are executing what? God's heart. God's will. You're not convincing God at all. He's convincing you. I'll say it again. You're not convincing God at all. He's convincing you to do this. I don't need any more qualifications than that. So, if we just fast forward a little bit, jump past a few thoughts. God, in his beautiful heart for all of us, sends the ultimate breaker. Everybody know what I'm talking about, right? Jesus, of course. But I want to ask you a question. I asked you earlier, if you're going to break something off, do you just say, I'll break it? Or is there something in your hand? Look at Psalm 2. I want you to look at Psalm 2. Verse 7 through 9. I want you to see how does God actually break something. I will declare the decree. If you never saw the sermon on 3D training, I highly suggest you look up NCG 3D training and understand the terms declare and decree. Those are two powerful words. I'm not going to do today. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your hand. Remember I was talking about earlier about the temptation of the devil? This already belonged to God. Okay, So the devil is just trying to mess with you on your journey. And the ends of the earth for your possession, they belong to Jesus. You shall what? Break them with the rod of iron. When does Jesus walk around the rod? Like some old street gang from the 80s. You know, leather jacket. It's always foggy and dark. And they walk around like this. What's up, man? What's up? Curly hair. Juice falling off the side. I don't see Jesus like that. But he said he had a rod. I want to know about the rod. He said... He was going to take it back with the rod. I find that interesting because he doesn't have a rod, but he does. I'll say it again. You don't see him with a rod, but I can assure you he has a rod. That's why I'm saying most people don't step into the fullness of the breaker. They understand the charismatic, the Holy Ghost, but there's a weapon behind this. And I can assure you an oppressor is a violent man, and he only understands violence. Violent men understand violence. Violence. They resort to violence because it's all they know. Jesus, being the Lord of all glory, chooses to meet them, if you will, with a little bit of violence here. Because why does it say you'll break them? 
He's like, Michael, you're being a little bit too firm with this. Would you mind reading Psalm 58, 6? Psalm 58, 6 says what? Break their teeth in their mouth, O oh God. Break out the fangs of the young lions. The young lions was the nations that were warring against God's people. Now I want to ask you a question. How many times do you see a demon screaming at Jesus? Or do you see them begging for mercy? That was that. They knew he carried a stick. And they said, have you come to torment me? Have mercy on me. I know you're a son of God. And he said, don't say a word. There you go. The guy understood what he carried. What did they say? Carry a big stick? Walk softly or walk strongly? I think it's walk strongly for Jesus. Here's my question, friends. How do we get to this level? If you want to become a man or woman who can break off oppression, we need to say, when a demon sees us, I will hurt you in the process. Simple as that. Because an oppressor won't be let go violently. Well, sorry, won't be let go softly. When Moses told Pharaoh to let his people go, what did Pharaoh do? Eh. <laughs> next time the next day, you let my people go. Eh. <laughs> he didn't take care at all. Do you think oppression will casually let his little prized possession go so quickly? I don't think so. Now, if you pray the first time and they're set free, thank God. And they pray the second time and they're set free, thank God. If you pray the third time, nothing's happening. Bring a stick. Do you follow that? Is that too hard? It's not going to do this Wednesday. We can handle it. You have to carry a stick, and you're going to say, "Okay, I've told you. Well, I've asked you. I've told you, and I'm going to force you out, and you're going to leave this person alone." That's the breaker. Now, let's look at it more carefully. Say, "Michael, I'm not walking around the rod. No, me either." Look at this. Psalm 29:5. We're talking about weaponry. <clears throat> Psalm 29:5 says, "The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars." Yes, the, split, the Lord splits the cedars of Lebanon. What I'm saying is this. When God speaks over a situation, Lebanon was counted as a mighty empire. Okay, You might not know this, but Lebanon is Assyria. Assyria was a dominant nation for a long time. Remember Jonah was sent to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria? They were the people. And God said, just my word will tear down the tallest of Lebanon's best. It's saying like a mighty warrior, their best they're the brightest. They're all their achievements. It says, my word, my voice, will tear down their best. So you understand this? So how did Jesus cast out demons? They said, what new doctrine is this? For with the word, he what? Casts out demons. That was a rod. When he spoke, it hit. And they were out. The oppression left. And people were healed on the spot. You got it. Man, we're going to roll this through now. Does that make sense? He said, the rod was my voice. It was mighty. It tore down enemy strongholds. When I spoke to it, things changed and people were set free. This is proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. That was Luke 4. We said, he opened Isaiah 61 said, this is me. I'm the one who's going to speak. And y'all are going to be free. Remember that? To set people free to open blind eyes. You do it. Come on. One more. <clears throat> Jeremiah gets the same revelation. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, verse 29, he says this. <clears throat> Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? So the word of God is what? The word of God is like a rod. It's like a hammer. It's like fire. Are you following this? When you come into a deeper revelation of God's word, you're not just getting stronger in yourself. Your word is becoming more powerful. I was going to use the word violent, but that might hurt someone's feelings. The word of God become, in you is becoming weaponry. It's becoming powerful and mighty and pulling down strongholds and casting every disobedient thought and ex that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10. Ultimately, as you grow and understand your role as a breaker, the same word that may have encouraged and healed and supported some is now becoming a weapon against who? The oppressors, the dominant spirits, the evil that is operating against God's people. Is that making sense? So the word of God is a two-edged sword. It's a very powerful weapon, and it can destroy evil. So I'm not asking you guys to scream at something and saying you recognize what I carry is violent against evil. They know it. When I know it, they know it. 
When I understand it, they know I understand it. Why? Because I'm coming at them with that. Good. <clears throat> All right, we're almost there. Don't worry. Let's look at a scripture that you guys know very well. Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Everybody know Isaiah 9? What is Isaiah 9? Come on, tell me. Wake up. Somebody. Isaiah 9 is famous for what? Isaiah 9, 6? Yes, yeah, go, let's go there. Uh, for unto us a child is born. Everyone else scripture? Yes, noon, Christmas time? I'm going to get you a child's Bible here shortly for some of you. No, I'm not joking either. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and it says the government will be on his shoulder. Remember the kingdom? Is that you continue to look at verse 7? It says of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. Guys, if you miss this, you're missing a lot. So I'm going to stop and do it again. Isaiah 9 says it's a prophetic verse about the Messiah, saying a child will be born who will bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Okay, I made it as simple as I can. He's bringing a new kingdom to earth. Now, would you mind, everybody hears that scripture around Christmas time, oh, unto us a child is born. Please, let's back it up to verse 3 through 5. Why did Jesus come to earth? You have multiplied the nation and increased his joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when the divide is full. Keep that in your mind. Verse 4. For you have broke... Put the two verses together. I want you to see why you rejoice. When a man has been freed from his yoke, you have multiplied the people. They have joy as though they had a harvest, as though they divide his spoil. Why do they have that? For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. Who is coming forth in the scripture? You just read it. I gave you the answer to make it easy. Isaiah 9 is the birth of Christ. Christmas, we call it Christmas. I hope moving forward you say we are celebrating the freedom that comes from the freedom from oppression. The Savior has freed you from oppression. If you are saved by Jesus' name, if you believe in your Messiah, you should be able to walk in freedom from oppression because God himself said, as I spoke, and a woman who, had, who was given birth by the Holy Ghost, that same miracle is the same miracle that says, I have now freedom to save people from oppression. I want to ask you a question. Does your salvation have power? I hope it does. I really hope you feel confident your salvation has power. It has power over sin. It has power over death. It has power of temptation. It has power over demons. Why doesn't your salvation have power over oppression then? If this is the source and the well of life, spoken in Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7, saying, this is the Messiah, and he gives me life everlasting, then that life should also be able to give freedom from oppression. Good. My friends, when you were born again, buried in baptism, alive in Christ, Galatians 2, verse 19 and 20, that means you were also born again as a what? Somebody who should free people from oppression. If we were born again, raised up in baptism, in the image of God, then you were also born again in the image of Isaiah 9, 3 and 4, which says we've been freed from oppression. Now I worry that maybe this was too hard. Can you handle one more insight? You sure? I hope so. We're going to do it again Wednesday anyways. I can't afford to lose this for you. Anybody remember Daniel 2? Daniel 2 is about King Ned. Nebuchadnezzar, that's hard. Babylon's king. Did they destroy God's people? Anybody remember Babylon's story? What did they do? They wiped out Jerusalem with ruthlessness. Assyria wiped out Israel. This is after the end of Chronicles of Kings. Assyria just erases them off the map. That's why people don't like Samaritans, because they were mixed. They weren't really Jews. And then Babylon comes and murders all Jerusalem. So here's the king Nebuchadnezzar. He's not a nice guy. He is the king who murdered Jerusalem and took them captive. Are you guys okay with that? He has a dream. He doesn't tell anybody the dream. Remember that? So Daniel prays, and Daniel gets a dream, and Daniel says, Listen, 
You saw a great image. Now the head was gold, and the body, the breastplate was silver, and the thighs were bronze, and the legs were clay, and the feet were clay and iron. It was mixed. The thighs were iron, sorry. And the feet were clay and iron. It said, suddenly a stone carved without hands came out of a mountain, and it what? It broke every kingdom to what? Pieces. Look at it now. Daniel 2, verse 44, he explains the dream. Verse 42, please look at this carefully and just make notes. You've got to study these chapters. Daniel 2, 44 says this. Daniel explains the dream. He says, and the days of these kings of God of heaven will set up a kingdom. What have we been talking for months? Which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom will not be left to other people. Meaning, nobody will take over the kingdom of heaven. They won't take a dominion, no oppression. It shall, it will, it has, and it will continue to break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45 says this. It isn't much as you saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces. Listen, guys. The breaking power of the kingdom from clay, iron, bronze, all the way to silver and gold. You know what that tells me? Whatever great or whatever small, the power of the kingdom within you can what? Break it into pieces. I'm just building you way beyond what you probably expected. It says, the great God has made known to the king and will come to pass after this. Here's your confidence. Look at Daniel. God bless this man. Super prophet over here. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. If you ask me for a dream, not so sure. Interpretation? Depends. I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> he says this is going to come to pass. What days are you living in? You're living in the day where the stone has already been cut out. His name, the cornerstone, is Jesus Christ. And he's already been released, and he's already massively destroyed everything. And so he's established a kingdom which can never be shaken. And this kingdom is the one that will break every power of darkness. You're part of the kingdom breaking group. When you said I'm part of the kingdom, by design, if you were recruited for God's army, you are a breaker for God's army. And by just speaking the kingdom of heaven over somebody, maybe you can break off an oppression. So you see, there's lots of ways to do this. Let's look at one more verse that Daniel gave. When he gave the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, read it here just to help you. Verse 35. Daniel 2.35 says, Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like what? Chaff from the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried away that that was what? Are you taking notes? No trace of it found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You look at Revelation, it's a mountain means kingdom. He says, the power of God's kingdom can break every assault, every power, every principality, Every darkness, every curse, every witchcraft, every evil, every sickness, every demon, every disease, every genetic thing, anything that has a word or without a word, it says, I can break it through my God's kingdom. How many understand that? Good. So I just want you to just look at this last slide. Would you mind putting it up there? Isaiah 14. We're not going to study. It's going to be our prayer point, and we have to pick it up on Wednesday. Isaiah 14 is very unique. Just listen to me, guys. Just listen to me. It says, God will have mercy on Jacob. It says, coming a day where God's people will have rest and celebrate for freedom from all oppression. Okay, you listening? And it begins to list the end of Assyria, the end of Babylon, the end of Egypt, the end of the Philistines, and the end of Lucifer. Have you all ever looked at the prophets? Have you ever noticed why they spend chapter after chapter saying the end of Babylon, the end of dark nations? Do you remember that? You all read Jer Jeremiah? The last four or five chapters? Come on. You ever read Ezekiel? You ever read Isaiah? It says it spends chapters saying heaven exalts itself for the end of Babylon. What are they really saying? They're saying these nations which were oppressing you will come to an end. So when you say, Michael, why do I have to read all these scriptures? I don't really care about the end of Edom. I don't know why I read about the end of uh, uh, the Abaddon. It's like, why 50 verses about this? He's saying every oppression, every nation that had ever touched God's people has a deliberate end. How many understand? This is why I asked you at the beginning. God said to me, Michael, what does it really mean? 
when you say, I break that curse, I break sickness, I break the what does it really mean? I hope by now maybe you have just an inkling or a thought after doing this much time together that when God has every nation listed that ever laid its finger, God said that whatever evil can come against you, even to the point that says, O Lucifer, how you exalt yourself and now you've fallen like the rest of them. The kings are glad that you were down here with them. Do you remember that? Isaiah says the fall of Lucifer is the exalting about the end. If it says Lucifer himself will be broken down, should not every evil according to Isaiah 14, be brought down to nothing. Shattered without a trace. And then an the east wind will just pick it up and leave it alone. You guys get this? So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to go into ministry time. And I'm pleading with you that it, at the very least in your faith, if there is an oppression right now, an evil troubling you, I need you to believe that through the prayer of this church as a body, it's going to walk away from you today. You're going to be set free. Is that okay? Is that all right? Because whatever evil it is, it's going to leave you. That's the Messiah. That's the power of the name Jesus Christ. And when people say, Jesus can save, I don't know if we have ever gone to that level of detail. Oh, I believe Jesus saves. Okay, good. But today we're going to be specific.